Hey there. Um, I have a lot of new people on my channel. If you're not, you know, people say, well, how do I contact you? Okay. I say if you're resourceful, you can find out. Uh, but that shows me people don't understand that or don't know that the description has a link to my website. My website has my email address. I can't respond to emails the way I used to uh, as far as like really being on top of it. I had to prioritize, but it is there. Uh, some, sometimes I get such abusive emails that I'm even careful of how, when and how I open emails. Um, I put my, I had to pray up and I thought about turning it off altogether, but there's too many people that actually get help and there's also a lot of encouragement that comes through. So I, uh, and also because I write books and stuff, I've got to have that open. Um, the other thing is I have books, uh. You know, a lot of this content has has uh, become books that are I would get that are life changing. Um, they're different than what you're finding in the Christian bookstores, and the language the Lord has given us uh, is different than what I found in commentaries. Um, you know, so please check it out, especially Romans. Uh, the ones that people really lightly have been. Um, getting help with is Romans uh, it's a thick one Romans 1 through 8 Christ is our life in Christ is our righteousness in heaven our life on earth and uh, Christ is our another one called Christ is our righteousness sanctification and reward and that is the track of my whole YouTube channel and that's kind of what I want to talk about here um, I want to talk about the parable of the talent and I've already done a very couple of very good messages on the parable of the talent uh, but I want to talk about how we look at parables um, because I had a discussion on my wall about the teaching of that a believer could be in outer darkness. You know, this idea that people are going to be punished when they see the Lord. This is one of the reasons why people don't get excited that the Lord is coming. It, it's because they are afraid in their conscience and it's due to false teaching. Uh, and my favorite scripture that the Lord gave me, I think, for this channel, one of them is, uh, Now little children abide in him, so that when he appears, you may have confidence in his coming and not shrink back in shame. Most pastors, and the way I used to look at this, handle this this way. Work hard so that you can boast in his coming and have a second justification that's worthy of reward. <laughs> uh, and everybody will praise you. It's your justification before men. You know, actually, the more I'm learning about the of the doctrine behind justification before men, the more I see it is a setup for a second justification where you are praised uh, in front of God and men for works um, unto a reward. It is works justification, and it, it becomes an accursed gospel. And I'm sorry, it, it, you know... You, you can, if, you know, the safest thing you can say about James 2 is, well, he's just talking about let your faith be profitable to men. You know, feed them. Okay. But the fact is he uses justification uh, to talk about it. And he talks about, does that faith save? And he's not talking about, does that save faith save the person who's hungry, who's asking you for food? He's talking about, does it save you? Um, so that is why every theologian has to handle it theologically because it's got that kind of language. By the time it gets down to you and I talking about it in a conversation, we say, well, he's just talking about, you know, help the guy out. He's hungry. But when you study, what is the roots of that idea that that's what he's talking about? Who's teaching that? Where does it come from? And then you go and look at their doctrine. You start to realize, actually, that is a watered down, distilled form of a doctrine that's talking about a second justification called justifi uh, a justification by works unto reward where you are being found... Uh, worthy of praise by men in the day of judgment because of your works. Um, 
and it's sad and it's tr they try to harmonize it with Romans 4 uh, and end up actually overthrowing Romans 4 by saying that there's a second justification there's not a second justification and Paul argues that so strongly the justification that secured the reward and the blessing for Abraham as well as uh, you know the forgiveness forgiveness of sins was all one justification secured by faith apart from works before he was circumcised 50 years before he offered Isaac before he'd done anything to him who works not the lays on him who justifies the ungodly it is one justification that secures it all because that justification relates me to Christ and Christ is the one who inherits everything and he's the one who did the work and he's the one who enters into his reward and shares it with me I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ entering into his reward and when he comes his reward is with him and you can either have your reward or his it really comes down to that you can either have your blessing or his you can have your inheritance or his and if you want your own kingdom and your own inheritance and your own reward and your own blessing well let's call it what it is it's called punishment it's called hell it's called outer darkness it's called uh, cursings okay because you are striving to establish your own righteousness your own qualification um, because if you're gonna have your own thing then you gotta have your own qualification it's apart from Christ it's not Christ himself uh, Christ is not your reward Christ is not your righteousness Christ is not your sanctification if you're looking to have your own kingdom your own inheritance your own reward your own blessing then you're gonna to have to have your own righteousness and your own sanctification and if you've got all that then you are Christless and if you are Christless in the day of judgment then you are outside the city you are with the dogs uh, you will be you're done okay and that's what people don't understand it's all or nothing um, it's not I'll take a little Christ and then I'll build up my own little kingdom and have my own reward and have my own inheritance and have my own uh, blessing and my own this and my own that no we have Christ we've been baptized into Christ and we've put him on and therefore we are Abraham's seed children of God and heirs according to the promise not because of anything in ourselves but because of Christ he is our relationship to any promise or reward or blessing because he is the blessed one he's the rewarded one he's the overcome overcomer he's the righteous one it's he who keeps my works to the end he's the one who entered it in, into it all he's the one who accomplished the work and he shares it all freely as a gift and you unless you receive the kingdom as a child and as a gift you won't enter in you won't receive it at all it's all or nothing um, and it's based on that understanding in the first place that there's anything called service in grace or reward in grace and we teach on this and you know pretty thoroughly in this um, and then people say well he teaches that there is no reward and therefore there's no service there's no priesthood and there is no uh, you know there's nothing and that's not true either and they want to use 1 Corinthians 3 to say, well, you know, you got to build or you'll suffer loss. That is true. Uh, if we build with wood, hay, and stubble, that will be burned off. When we see the Lord, the fire of that day will try the work. What quality it is, what materials we were building with. And if it is uh, not of incorruptible material, meaning of Christ himself because no other foundation can be laid but uh, that which is laid which is Christ himself if it's not gold so, silver and precious stone which is all related to Christ and I don't have time to get into that here but those those are actually developed for us in the scriptures uh, then it is wood hay and stubble it's chaff and it'll be burned off in an instant in the twinkling of an eye when the corruptible is put off for incorruptibility and it will be behind us 
when we see the Lord. It will not be brought out for inspection. It will not be referenced at all. And it will be lost. It will be suffered as lost. In the same way Paul said, I suffer the loss of all things and count them as loss. I tolerate it. It's to tolerate. To suffer loss is you allow the loss of all things. We're going to allow the loss of everything that's wood and stubble. Yet we will be saved. And yet it will be as through fire. But there will be some people who never understood grace and in their arrival will have only themselves been saved and will have built with wood hay and stubble and it'll all have been burnt off when they get there. And so what is he talking about though that is the reward? Well, the reward is, are you not our crown and our rejoicing and our reward at his coming? And the reward is the building because we're building with precious materials. The building is the new city, Jerusalem, the house of God, the habitation of God and spirit. And even in 2 Corinthians 5, when it talks about every man is going to uh, uh, receive the work which he's wrought in his body, what is that? Whether good or bad, well, it's rubbish or um, excellent. Again, it's either you're going to receive the glory that's been... Uh, the, the habitation that you are building is Christ wrought in you. How much grace have you enjoyed? How much Christ has passed through you to others and built up the body of Christ? Because whatever's built in others is also built in you. Because in the New Testament ministry, there's two copies of every letter. We comfort others with the comfort which we've been comforted with by God. And when we do, it's a writing so that they become epistles of Christ written, not with ink, uh, but with the spirit of the living God, known, manifested, and known of every man, written in our hearts. So they are epistles of Christ written on, but they're written in our hearts as well. It's two copies. So when we enjoy Christ and those comforts come to us, and then those comforts come to somebody else as well. Now there's two copies. Whatever got built into me got built into you. And that's the building. And that is actually going to be somehow put on display as the building that we put on. A habitation of God of in incorruptibility according to 2 Corinthians 5. He's talking about the building of God. When he talks about every man will receive uh, what they've the good or the bad what they've done in their body he's talking about the house they're going to put on we all have grown in this tabernacle having the first fruits of the spirit to be longing to be clothed with life and to put on our house from God we have a house from God uh, in the heavens which is built and that building work is being accomplished now in the ministry which is our Christian life our Christian life is a ministry it's the it's Christ making his home in our heart and, and being built up in love and being built together with the saints in love. Well, if you don't understand grace at all, there's no building work. And we have been talking about that, that there's many who err in their ways and have not known his ways. And even though they're saved, they always think of Christ as the hard taskmaster. They're always hovering around Sinai and dead works. And they've never entered into an enjoyment of Christ. And it's based on the fact that they've been taken off as spoil. And they, in their mind, are alienated. And they think, why did this happen to me? Did you just bring me out here to die? And they never get renewed so that their concept of the Christian life is compatible with the gospel. Okay, so that does limit how much you built with and you everything you do ends up being wood, hay, and stubble. And these kind of people end up in the institutional churches working their butts off, but they're not building anything. They're building with wood, hay, and stubble, and actually they're the guy in the parable of the talent who is digging. Their work is a digging, and what they're doing is burying the talent. The more they work, the more the talent gets buried. And the talent really is the gospel. The goodness what they've of what they've received is being buried. The value of it is being buried. And the more they're doing it, the harder, in their mind, the taskmaster's face, the sterner his face gets. Because 
in their mind, he's the hard taskmaster who reaps where he did not sow and expects them to give him when they, they didn't receive anything to begin with. They're burying their talent and all their work. Um, so there will be degrees of glory in eternity that have to do with how much Christ we gained here. But it is not based on works. This is the, this is, it's based on the enjoyment of grace. It's the exact opposite. It's the exact opposite of works. That's why the prostitutes and the sinners and the uh, lepers, you know, enter the kingdom first. They enter the enjoyment first because they know they have nothing but need. And they know that Jesus didn't do anything but save them. He didn't put a burden on them. And they don't have any sense that he expects anything from them. And so they just go in rejoicing. Whereas the guy who's got it all together and thinks, Oh, now I'm going to serve Jesus too with all my abilities. He may be saved, but he doesn't enter the kingdom. The kingdom is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. He never enters into that. Because to him, it's all of works. Now, he may not be saved. You know, sometimes it's hard to tell. But a lot of people who are working the hardest are not enjoying the rally of the kingdom at all. And some people who you think are not working at all are actually enjoying the feast. And it's funny because what we talk about is enjoying the feast. And, and you know, the pro prodigal son parable the prodigal son was in the house feasting and that was where all the stewards were instructed to prepare the fatted calf so that the prodigal son would have the feast that's where the work was going on in the kingdom but it's a feast but outside there's the older brother who's keeping commandments and working in the field and he thinks he's the one doing the work he's like you never had a feast for me I kept all your commandments and I've worked out here I've served you He's like, you could have had a feast at any time. Why won't you go into the house? You're not, you haven't served yet. But he thinks he's going to have a reward at the end called a feast. No, the, the reward is the feast and the reward happens by enjoying the feast. If you don't enjoy the feast today, then you don't have much to feast on. Uh, you're outside, you know, um, but then the father invites him into the feast. Is that guy saved? Well, here's the problem with parables. And this is what I want to talk about. You do not generate doctrine from parables. That's a no-no. Uh, parables are not for you to generate doctrine from. And see, this is where there are certain groups of people, and I was under a Chinese group that did this, uh, they develop ideas that there are punishments at the Bema Seat Judgment, and then there are believers who will be in the outer darkness for a thousand years weeping and gnashing their teeth as a discipline for not having been faithful, or for not having enough oil, or for not having the right wedding garment. And they do this in the name of eternal security. They say, well, you can't say they're not believers. You know, you're taking away people's salvation and their assurance by saying that those people aren't believers. It seems like it's in the name of eternal security. They say, you know, you're so all or nothing, you're saying that they're not saved, uh, but they're carnal. You know, they're carnal Christians, and they didn't overcome, and they didn't serve the Lord faithfully, and so he's going to deal with them in that way. And that's actually a comfort, because they have eternal life. There's more people saved than you think. Um, it's a straw man argument because the true grace position, which most people would call hyper grace, and that's where we stand, is, look, the carnal saints in Corinthians are saved. They're known by their testimony, not their behavior. And he told them they would reign over angels and, in the, and subject the world to come would be subject to them. They All things are theirs, whether life or or death, or Cephas, or Paul, or Apollos. Everything is theirs, and they are Christ, and Christ is God's. Uh, they didn't need to fear something called outer darkness. Where do we get our doctrine from? Our doctrine, our understanding of what is actually true, literally, and what to expect, 
as far as our destiny is concerned and how salvation works and who it's true for comes from the gospel, especially Paul. And what is justification secure and who has what? What do I have because of my faith? That comes from our doctrine, which is taught by primarily Paul and confirmed in John and Peter especially. And then in the rest of the word, it's all there. But Paul was given by the ascended Christ, the final revelation to complete the word of God and really the key to interpret everything. And especially, I told somebody, read Romans 1 through 5 and don't come out of it until you understand the arguments in there. And even if it takes you years. And once you do, you'll be inoculated against every kind of heresy that strikes at the foundation of justification and tries to steal your crown. Um, parables are not a source for doctrine. Parables are, they hide truth. And Jesus said, any scribe that's instructed in the kingdom uh, is like a, tr a householder who, when he comes to the parables, brings old and treasures out old and new. He's always able to bring new treasures out of the parables. They're infinitely deep. They contain mysteries in them. They hide spiritual truth, but it's the one who's instructed in the kingdom that is able to bring things out of them. In other words, you come to them with your doctrine. You don't come with them to get doctrine. You come to them with your doctrine. To be instructed in the kingdom means you know the doctrine of Christ. Then when you come to the parable, you read your doctrine into it. You don't take doctrine out of it. And here's the problem with, for example, the parable of, uh, well, what people do with the parables is they try to set parameters and go, okay, who's saved in that parable? So, you know, is the prodigal son's older brother saved? I don't know. Did he go to the feast afterwards? Seems like he must be saved because the father's his father. But if you want to, if you want to, uh, if you want to establish it doctrinally, You'd have to say, well, no, he's not saved because he doesn't believe in justification. He believes in justification by works and he's outside the house and he's not enjoying the feast at the time of the feast during resurrection. So, no, you know, I mean, or you say, well, he's got to be in the place of Israel and the prodigal son's got to be in the type of the church. All of those things are actually true. All of them are possibly true because a parable contains spiritual truth that based on the doctrine you have and know, you will see in it. It contains all the truths. Um, it is not to generate doctrine about who's saved and who's not. It is to give you uh, a story that you can use to illustrate any true spiritual doctrine. Um, so the parable of the talents, the guy who buries his talent, he's cast into outer darkness. Well, what do people do with that? Okay, well, he didn't work hard enough, so he lost his salvation. There's, there's one group that teaches that. He lost his salvation because he wasn't faithful, and that shows that you have to uh, work. It's by works, and uh, then he got, you know, he, he got thrown in outer darkness and that's hell. Okay. That's one do where you take the parable and generate a doctrine that refutes eternal security. Then there's another group that says, no, he's saved, but the reward that the others received is for the overcoming believers. And there's a place called outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth for believers who are not faithful as a discipline. They've, what is that? That's a doctrine that you generated from the parable because there's no teaching in the scripture about a place called outer darkness. It's only mentioned in parables. You don't have anything in Paul that talks about an outer darkness. Now the Catholics, the mystics, really loved this. They took it and made a purgatory out of it. And they synced it with Paul's day of uh, Christ and suffering of loss, 1 Corinthians 3, which the Bema seek judgment 
of was a mystery hidden in Christ for a group that was a mystery hidden in Christ called the body of Christ uh, not known not revealed any time before Paul it's not revealed in the scriptures that group of people and its destiny is not revealed in the scriptures and the day of the Bema seat is a celebratory victory day like the Greek Olympics where they hand out prizes um, at the Greek Olympics they don't have a special place called outer darkness for the people who didn't win the Olympics to be thrown in and uh, weep and gnash their teeth for a thousand years no they're in the crowd applauding uh, unless you're in a communist country or China and then you're shot you know uh, you train all, and now you've misrepresented the country and you've brought shame and so now you're gonna be killed or whatever I mean in the worst cases uh, that's not what Paul has in mind it is a victory day where everybody is celebrating and not only that but everybody partakes of the this is the inheritance the new the the, the reward that's built is the unveiling of the masterpiece of God that was wrought by Christ who's the who's the builder of the house uh, and then we are all partakers of this we're qualified by the blood to partake of the inheritance of the saints in light and it's his inheritance and we're all entering into it as an enjoyment and I use the example of the museum at the bottom of the arch we have the arch here everybody can go up in the arch and enjoy the arch okay but there is a group of people who's got a museum down at the bottom of the arch and they've got pictures of them as they actually participated in building the arch and their families uh, there's a memorial and there's names on the arch on on the new city Jerusalem of the apostles the tribes uh, that are a memorial to their part it will be remembered what every every uh, every tear you've ever cried has been bottled up every sigh to the Lord every genuine turn to the Lord that's produced a fragrance in his garden to him in your heart has all been remembered it, it is going to be abundantly and generously recompensed to you beyond your wildest imagination because every ounce is re recompensed in a eternal way in an incorruptible way that never fades and we can't understand what that means we don't know what it means that to have an inheritance incorruptible that never fades it means your enjoyment of it never fades you know and each of us has a private experience with the Lord that he's going to openly you know the father who sees in secret will reward openly that's all true but it's based on his generosity remember the parable of the uh, the uh, uh, vineyard workers the 11th hour laborer got the same as the other guys who've been working all the whole time and when they got mad he said well don't be mad at me because I'm generous the, which shows that the in the principle that the reward is based on the generosity of the Lord not the amount of toil or the length of the toil or the work you know um, but it's all coming out of his generosity for us in that he remembers everything he worked in us and everything he was able to gain this is deep. It's way deeper than I can get into in one message, and that's why I recommended uh, the book Christ is Our Righteousness, Sanctification Reward. And there's another little book. It's like 70 pages. You can get to it real fast, and you can buy a bunch to give to your friends. Try to make it cheaper, too. But it's uh, uh, Rewards and Service and Grace. The links are in the description, and you can um, get them free as ebooks or buy the book. I'm sorry. i got to push these. This is my slow season, too, and it's like I'm conscious. I... I I wrote all these books. I need people to know about them. And I don't advertise them enough. Um, but anyway, uh, the parable of the prodigals, of the, of the parable talents. Okay, the, the way people develop doctrine. Okay, well, the do outer darkness is a place for believers. The outer darkness is hell. Those are two doctrines that people have generated from outer darkness, which is not a doctrine. There's no doctrinal teaching about outer darkness. It's a parable. You don't generate your doctrine from parables. Or, well, that's a parable for Israel. And I actually, that one helped me for a while. Oh, these parables are for Israel because, um, they're, and they're not for the church. And it is true, like the parable of the uh, 
th that parable in a way doesn't apply to the church because we are not slaves we're sons and heirs we're not here toiling okay uh and it, so it's got to apply to people who are slaves but not sons and heirs um it does not apply to the church in that sense legally the the parable of the virgins does definitely does not apply to the church because she is the bride not the bridesmaids being invited to the wedding you know so that helped me get free because I believed I was going to be in outer darkness for leaving this cult I thought I was going to be one of the bridesmaids that didn't have enough oil however what that led to is that's the answer. That's for the Jews. James is for the Jews. Hebrews is for the Jews. The seven letters and seven churches is for the Jews. Why? Because they believe all the different things, uh, the, the doctrines that say, oh, well, the overcomers are the special group of people that overcome and keep the commandments. And the uh, people who have the oil are the special group of people that do get saved and don't go to the outer darkness. And the guy who didn't bury his talent, uh, or the guy who buried his talent, is the unfaithful servant and the guy who didn't have a wedding garment on is the one who didn't keep his works to the end and so they have all these doctrines that they're generating either th from bad interpretations of the scripture or from taking doctrine from parables and to avoid all that they've made up a new system of doctrine called hyper dispensationalism where Oh yeah, justification is by works if you're a Jew. <laughs> or in a different dispensation. If any man could be, ever be justified by works, Christ died in vain. So no, that hyper-dispensationalism is totally false. It's totally refuted by Paul himself. I don't have time to get into that. But these guys who claim that Paul is their apostle and they're totally Pauline never argue from Paul. They always want to take you to James and Matthew and the seven letters and these places to show you that there's a group of people that can be justified by works. And that's the main point of their argument when it gets right down to it. Avoid them. Okay. But the parable of the guy who buried his talent, what is that? What are these parables? Are they really not for the church? And that's what I thought for the first three years, uh, two years of my channel. Well, that's not for the church at all. And, um, unfortunately, that falls under the category of that's for the Jews. Well, then who's it for? You saying there's a group of people that that applies to literally? Okay. Uh, is, now the one that, that's dangerous. It brings people under work salvation. Anytime you make a doctrine out of any of these, you bring in work salvation, either for that group over there or for the weak, failing Christians. You know, now the there are groups that teach. I was in one for the Chinese group for a long time. The one, the ones who teach that this uh, is speaking of unfaithful Christians tell you that the majority of the body of Christ will be in outer darkness. It's not like they say, well, that's an extreme case and there's only a few of them. They teach that the majority of the body of Christ will be in outer darkness during the millennium. The majority. Whenever I teach about uh, 1 Corinthians 3 and he talks about the severity, I always say it's an extremely rare case that he's using. He's using very strong language to say, yet that person will be saved and yet as through fire. He, because he is actually not talking about the believers themselves. He's talking about false teachers and he's actually talking about unbelievers. In extreme cases, a believer may only so uh, build with wood, hay, and stubble. But he separates the people getting from the, re the rewards that he's talking about from the believers themselves by saying, you know, we are stewards and servants of God. We are your servants and stewards of the mysteries of God. We are just ministers. You are God's field. You are God's building. And you are God's temple. And and since you are God's field and God's building, I as a wise master builder have laid a foundation, but uh, let he, anyone who builds on that foundation has to be careful what kind of materials they build with. If anyone builds on that foundation um, with wood, hay, and stubble, or gold, silver, precious stones, the day will declare. It doesn't say Jesus Christ is going to inspect it. It says the day will declare it because the day, the work will be tested by fire. What fire? Well, we're all going to be baptized with fire 
when we're transfigured in the twinkling of an eye and this corruptible is burned off and we put on incorruptible and part of the burning off will deal with wood hay and stubble which is just a synonym for the flesh he's been talking about the difference between the flesh and the spirit and what the cross crucified but the ministers are supposed to be building now that he wants them all to be ministers all christians should be ministers but here he's talking about the false ministers and he's distinguishing them from the true ministers and he's about to warn them that satan's apostles have been teaching them and they're accepting them and this is the root of their carnality and he tells them well we apollos and cephas and i um are just we're nothing why are you boasting in men? He's really talking about you're boasting in these false apostles, but we've transferred as a figure to ourselves when all things are yours. You're going to judge angels. Everything is yours, whether life or, or death or Cephas or Paul or Apollos, things to come, and you're Christ and Christ is God's. Um, but we are stewards of the mysteries of God and ministers for your sake, and yes, we're all one and yet we're nothing, but we each have a reward for our work. So God's not unrighteous, but we are co-laborers with God, and it's God who gives the increase. That's what he says. We well, Paul waters, Apollos, uh, I, Paul plants, Apollos waters. God gives the increase, but we each have a reward for our work, even though we're one and and we're nothing. Don't think of us as anything. We're just ministers. We're stewards, but we'll be rewarded. We'll be taken care of. But then he says, "You are God's building, or you are God's temple, and if anyone." destroys the temple of God, him God will destroy. There he's talking about false teachers who are not even believers. But he says, um, the day is going to declare the work, what sort it is, and some people are building with wood, hay, and stubble, and the day is going to declare it, and it's going to be burnt off, yet they will be saved as yet through fire. Okay, Now that, I always say, is an extreme case. If you're a genuine believer and a genuine minister, Chances are you've got something that's not going to be burned off. First of all, you have your spirit. But you've had, there's not only your ministry work, but there's the building of Christ in you. And he bottles up our tears. Jesus is so generous that he's looking for a chance to give a reward to the person who gives a glass of water in his name. So somebody comes to you in the name of a, uh, uh, in his name asking for a glass of water and you give it to him he says he will not lose his reward remember every reward we receive is eternal and unfading it's all based on his generosity and his generosity is going to surprise us all he said in hebrews he is not unjust to forget that you've ministered to the saints and do minister how many times have you encouraged a brother you've forgotten the lord hasn't forgotten any of it and every single ounce of it is coming back to you. You sow your bread on on many waters and it comes back multiplied. Anything you sow to the Spirit comes back in eternal life. And eternal life is always multiplied. That's the blessing of Abraham is multiplication. You sow to the Spirit, it comes back multiplied. I'm not talking about the charismatics. I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about God's generosity and his blessing in the inheritance that's incorruptible and the unfading crown that you have. Okay? And it's based on understanding the value of what you've received that you start to rejoice and that joy is your strength. And that is what motivated the two guys with the talents to multiply their talents, right? And Jesus told the guy who buried his talent, why didn't you give it to, instead of burying it, why didn't you give it to the bank? Then you would have had compound interest. Compound interest is a multiplication that outstrips simply doubling. What the guy with two talents did was he doubled his, and then he had five, right? Or not double. What do you do? You, whatever two, whatever you do to get five from two. And then the guy who had five talents doubled it, and then he had ten. Well, compound interest, the guy who had one talent, if he'd have just done a little with it, just a little, it would have increased forever, multiplying to him exponentially forever. That's what compound interest is. I mean, if it, you know, it, we're all bad at saving, but we all know we should. Rich people understand compound interest. And, uh, 
It's because he did not understand the value of what he received that he buried his talent. But was he not working? Damn right he was working. He was working harder than the other two guys. What was his work? He was digging that hole to bury that treasure. Digging and digging and digging and digging. And the whole time he's digging, he's thinking, this the heart taskmaster, I knew you were a shrewd man. And when he goes and sees the, the, the boss, he's like, I knew you were a shrewd man. Reaping where you did not sow and expecting a harvest where you hadn't given any seed. Unbelievable what he said to the Lord or to the boss, right? And so he said, well, you knew that I didn't do that. Basically, what you see of the boss or of the Lord is going to govern how you do. And so what what did he see? He did not see any value in what he received. If he had, he would have given it at least to the bankers and he would have seen and rejoiced and seen its increase. Uh, and also, his vision of the Lord, because he didn't understand the value of what he received, was skewed so that he was the hard taskmaster. Uh, shrewd and there's no grace. And he said, it's based on what you see. That's why you dug and buried it. And it's based on what you see that you're going to receive. Okay. Now that is this, it was he saved. That's not the question. This is not a doctrinal parable talking about eternal life. This is not even talking about rewards. Really? This is talking about when it comes to serving the Lord, there is no service. If you don't know the gospel, and you don't know grace. If it's of works, that's who you are. If you think serving the Lord is a matter of works, then you are burying your talent. You don't know what you've received. And the talent we've received is really the gospel. That's the only thing that we can have that's been given to us that can increase as we perceive its value. And what is that? It's the declaration of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. It tells us of the work he's done but the more we understand the work he's done for us, the more we understand the person behind the work and the person who gave the work, the person who, who gave us the talent is the person who employed us. And he, he, you know, the other guys came to him boldly, confidently and rejoicing. Okay. Now abide in him, little children, so that when he appears, you may have confidence that is coming. Some people say, well, that means you got to work so that when he comes, you know, you'll have something to boast of. No, it says, if that which you heard from the beginning abides in him, in you, then you will abide in the Father and in the Son. And that which you heard from the beginning is the promise of eternal life. It all comes down to, do you understand what you've received? Abiding in the Lord has to do with understanding what he's given you and seeing it for what it really is. And the more you understand the value of what you received and not be moved away from it, the more you're going to understand his smiling face and his love and the more confident you are and the more bold you are and the more satisfied you are and the more restful you are, the more full of joy you are, the more full of strength you are and the more the spirit you have because the spirit is supplied through the hearing of faith. The more filled with him you are, the more fragrance of Christ you have, the more building of God there is. And of course, all that comfort is going to spill out to others because if you're thirsty, you come to him to drink and out of your most innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Others will be refreshed. The focus is not the work. It's all based on what do you see? That's the parable. And you can get infinite stuff from this parable. Now it is true with the parables. They're also there to hide truth. If you're a works guy, you're going to see the parable and you're going to confirm your works doctrine. You're going to see the Lord is a hard taskmaster and that guy didn't work hard enough. The, no, the other guys didn't work hardly at all compared to the guy that was digging to bury that talent. He, he was terrified of the taskmaster. And he's like, I knew I was scared. I knew you were a hard man. And so I buried and hid what was yours so nobody could take it so that when you came, I'd have it here. You have what's yours. I guarded your treasure. I guarded it for you. You know, that is fear. And he spent his whole life protecting that to make sure that I don't want to lose my salvation. You know, I don't want to lose. I don't want to lose it. That's what a legalist is. 
They do everything based, motivated out of fear uh, of loss because they think I'm going to give an account for this. You know, the other guys were, were careless with the master's treasure. They just ran out and multiplied it. That means they, they, they exchanged it for more. They gave it to somebody, you know, they just went out and lived wild and carefree. They would have probably been judged by that guy as not doing anything while he was digging. He, you know, they're the, the two guys we see working that get rebuke are both digging in the field. Like the older son and the prodigal, Peril the prodigal and this guy are both digging away. You know, and they both have a wrong view of God. Again, these parables are not for you to generate doctrine from. And all the groups that do end up being cults or heretical or just wrong. Now, somebody said, okay, there's this group of people that teach really well on justification. I've received a lot of help from them. Um, and there's a group that Milton Bible Church does a good job of exposing the doctrinal flaws of some of these groups. Milton Bible Church has some of their own problems. Uh, in other words, when I read some of their stuff, I, there's some things I didn't like. But they, I've read some of their exposés, and they're usually pretty balanced and fair when they approach the teachings of some of these groups, and they they do a really good job of doing their homework, and I do appreciate it. But uh, they were really soft on this one group, and I was like, why are you so soft? I think they should be marked and avoided. And I commented that in the field. Uh, it, I was on the wall. Somebody was saying, well, these guys, they are good. You should listen to them. And I said, I'm sorry, but these guys should be marked and avoided. And he said, I don't think they teach that, the outer darkness and the rewards and punishments. Uh, and I said, yeah, that's an accursed gospel. And that that's, they should be marked and avoided. That's accursed. And I and he said, well, I don't think they teach that. And I said, well, here's, a, here's some of their articles that do teach that. And here's a site a link to site that critiques it but in their critique they're awfully generous and they say that these guys are servants of the Lord that are really doing their best to, and they love these brothers and they're just exposing the truth and not wanting to um, bring harm to these brothers I said I think they should be stronger these people should be marked and avoided and he said well why why do you say they're accursed why should they be accursed you know why should they be marked and avoided and that's because an accursed gospel comes in the name of the true gospel and changes the terms of the true gospel. It's not like the Mormons where they've totally got a different Jesus and you know, or the Lord shippers where you go, they, they deny justification altogether and deny eternal life and deny, you know, you know, a Lord shipper right away that that you don't have to worry about them after an argument with them, you're done. But the accursed gospels come in he says, Paul says, I marvel that you were so soon removed from him who called you from another uh, to another gospel, which is not another, only some would trouble you seeking to pervert the gospel of Christ. They come with the gospel of Christ, but they pervert it to trouble you, and in doing so, they move you away from him that called you. They screw up your relationship with the person of Christ by perverting his gospel. It's not that they bring you a different gospel, they pervert the one you've already got by changing its terms. And in Galatians, they changed the term of justification so that it no longer included everything uh, that was yours by right as a son and an heir. They developed doctrines around justification to get you working for what you'd already received as a gift, okay? And that's what these doctrines do. When you develop doctrines from parables and put us back in the position of a slave where we're working, for a wage or you're going to get punished now we're back under the law and it absolutely ru ruins your relationship with the lord and guarantees that you're going to be that guy digging it turns you into the guy you know if you believe that that parable is about working hard enough for the lord in order to be rewarded then you are going to be in the flesh because uh the law principle is the mind of the flesh and you do think he's the hard taskmaster, and you do think you need to come up with it yourself, and you are going to be working to protect what's yours. You don't do it based on the joy of what you've already received. You do it in order to, you do your work in order to gain something or not lose something. 
you know, it's a mammon principle. And the mammon principle of the slave is the principle of the bondwoman who's cast out. It's not legitimate and it can't be justified. It receives no reward. It's cursed. So it uh, puts you under condemnation by default. It destroys your relationship with the Lord and it destroys your life. And I know from experience and I know from thousands, hundreds of people at least, maybe thousands now, who've come to me with these doctrines, not just from one group, but from so many groups that teach these kind of things. It destroys their faith. It doesn't mean that they've lost their salvation, but they've lost all their effectiveness and they're depressed. They can't read their Bible. They're under condemnation. They, uh, they don't know how to fellowship with the Lord anymore. And they think that when they see him, their next appointment with him is going to be a disaster. They're dreading the marriage feast. They're dreading seeing the Lord. Because the very doctrines, uh, the doctrine of justification, the one that's supposed to set them free, and the doctrine of reward, the one that's supposed to fill them with joy, is, has been colored so that Christ is now the hard taskmaster and they're being beaten. Okay, uh, that's all I've got. Uh, I hope I know this is really scattered. It was really inspiration and spirit. I wanted to remind you of those books, but I also wanted to tell you why we do not generate doctrine from parables and use that one as an example. Um, we use the parables to give color to our doctrine, but we've got to have good doctrine. It's the scribe that's instructed in the kingdom that then pulls treasures out of the parables. All right, take care.